wash your hands, wash your hands, <laughs> stop, first wash your hands. Before you play, you have to wash your hands. If Jeremy Brandt has said those words um, to our children once, I know that he said them a hundred times, and I wouldn't really be wrong if I said a thousand times, because they were said to each child every day after school for years uh, somehow that simple step never became routine for our very beautiful, clever, precocious, and evidently really, really dirty small children. Uh, I eventually figured out that I've got to reinforce the message myself. Dad's not enough. So I have my own communication style, and my inquiries were a little bit like this. Have you washed your hands yet today? I don't think I heard the water running. I don't think I heard the sound of hand washing. Hey, are your hands wet or dry? Can I look at your hands? <laughs> I'm pretty sure you haven't washed your hands. Do you disagree with me at this time? <laughs> we harped on these three children all the time, every day, all the way through their elementary years. And for the record, we are not mean, judgmental, hard-hearted human beings. We are solid parents, just trying to minimize sickness in our school-age kids. We hold the learned wisdom that it's better not to pass around a lot of germs. And so we are trying, often in an uphill battle, to lead wisely these youngsters we've been given, to train them up in some easier way of life based on a few simple habits. And that story is why I want to take a minute before we read the Bible to speak up in defense of the Pharisees. You know who those guys are, right? Um, they are mostly known as the bad guys of the New Testament with good reason. This is the group of people who's often seen in opposition to Jesus. They're kind of like permanently scowling, I think. When you hear them or see them represented, they're very grouchy. Uh, this is the group that's thinking wrongly at best and acting harmfully at worst. Uh, they, they are the ones that get the most of Jesus's anger, I think. Because first, they discount Jesus as a prophet of God. Then they try to embarrass and discredit him. And ultimately, they conspire to have him killed. All that is true. And also, at the same time, these guys are the leaders in Jewish communal life. These are the most educated set, the most influential people. And they've been entrusted with a heavy load, a big burden. They hold the faith. And it's their job to keep it alive and pass it along. They were supposed to train each new generation of precocious, adorable, beautiful, dirty young people um, into an easier life following a few of God's simple habits or commandments. But here's a complication. Unlike Christianity, our religion is completely not like this. Ancient Judaism was both a faith practice and a national identity. It was their nationality as well as their religion. So a lot depended on these guys, these leaders of the flock. They became enforcers and nitpickers, but they were given the job of being keepers and arbiters. And really, what is the gap between those two sets of things? Is the leap very far? I'm not looking to admire the Pharisees. I'm just looking to understand. I'm trying to relate to where they came from and what might be driving them. I'm working to view another group of human beings with empathy. And you know how to do this too, because most of the parents in the room just did it. When I started in on my family's struggle to keep our hands clean, um, many of you parents automatically related. So I'll point out, before we even get to today's scripture, that what kicks off the conflict here is some Pharisees telling Jesus and company that they really should clean their hands. <laughs> it is relatable. If we start out with understanding, if we start out looking to see why a group of grown men would harp on other grown men about a very small thing, then what the Pharisees really get wrong might just hit different. And that might be what we need. Empathy might open us up to see more that's true for ourselves. 
Because while most modern Bible readers think that the Pharisees are the kind of people we'd never be, we are the Pharisees in a whole lot of Jesus' stories. I want to read for us part of Mark chapter 7. Mark is the first gospel, gospel just meaning the good news of the life of Jesus of Nazareth. It's the shortest of four and the most swiftly moving. Mark just gets to the point. Man, waste no time. So that in uh, chapters one through six, Jesus has already done all these things. Imagine a checklist here. Uh, Called disciples, begun a healing ministry, walked throughout the seaside villages around the Sea of Galilee, performed a a miracle on the Sabbath, cured a demon-possessed man. Uh, That's when he sent the man's demons into the pigs, and the pigs went off the side of a cliff. Fascinating. He's cured uh, a dead girl and healed a long, sick woman on the way to, to handle the girl. Jesus has calmed the sea for his frightened disciples. He's revisited his hometown with them. He's fed the 5,000, and he's walked on water. All that in chapters 1 through 6. And all of it did not go unnoticed. All that action out here in the boonies of the empire um, has been noticed in the capital city of Jerusalem. So the keepers of the faith there, or the gatekeepers of the faith as the case may be, now show up to check this new rabbi out. And so I start at verse 1 of chapter 7. The Pharisees and some legal experts from Jerusalem gathered around Jesus. They saw some of his disciples eating food with unclean hands. They were eating without first ritually purifying their hands through washing. The Pharisees and all the Jews don't eat without first washing their hands carefully. This is a way of observing the rules handed down by the elders. So the Pharisees and the legal experts asked Jesus, why are your disciples not living according to the rules handed down by the elders, but instead, why do they eat food with ritually unclean hands? And Jesus replied, Isaiah really knew what he was talking about when he prophesied about you. You hypocrites, he wrote, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far away from me. Their worship of me is empty, since they teach instructions that are human words. You ignore God's commandment while holding on to rules created by humans and handed down to you, Jesus continued. Clearly, you are experts at rejecting God's commandments in order to establish all these rules. You do away with God's word in favor of the rules handed down to you, which you now pass on to others And you do a lot of other things just like that. Then Jesus called the crowd again. Let all who have ears hear. And Jesus said, listen to me, all of you, and understand. Nothing that comes out of a person can enter and contaminate a person in God's sight. Rather, the things that come out of a person contaminate the person. Yeah, that concise assessment, that breakdown right there is the reason to read the gospel of Mark for yourselves because in it, Jesus consistently just gets to the heart of things. Jesus can clearly see what has gone wrong over time here in this position called Pharisee, in this role or job title. Jesus knows the history better than they know it. And he wastes no time bringing out the big guns. He invokes Isaiah, most well-known prophet of old, beloved, renowned, powerful Isaiah. And he basically says, Isaiah would know you're all frauds. He'd look at you and know. You may look good on the outside. You may be good at the show here that you're putting on. You may even think you are all aligned with God, but I see you and your hearts are disconnected. This tradition you say you're upholding, you have instead betrayed the minute you relieved yourself of the obligation to love. God has now become your cover for teaching whatever serves you best. Ouch, right? That sounds like a solid burn for the bad guys. 
But please remember, we are also those guys. So often, we miss Jesus' point if we only notice how mad he is at this one group. Because any group, any person at any time in history can fall prey to exactly the same kind of thinking that got the Pharisees in trouble. We can believe we're putting our ideals first. We can believe we're putting the preservation of the institution first. But then, so easily, we can gut the whole thing we're trying to save by protecting our own rules over listening for what is God's command. It's surprisingly easy to hollow out a Christian faith to make it mean nothing more than a few cursory obligations and social norms and public stances. It's real easy to define Christianity based on who we're against. But that won't do anything to meet God's unceasing, still relevant call on our lives to engage and be for, to do justly, to embrace kindness, to walk humbly, to love God with heart, soul, and mind, and to love neighbor as self. Jesus offers us uh, an example in two verses that I skipped. This empty shell kind of faith knows, for instance, that honor your mother and father is part of uh, the Ten Commandments given to Moses. So what seems right to this sort of faith is to figure out what monetary gift would honor my parents. I will gather the money, I will give the gift, and then I will assume that that commandment is met. Parents honored, check. But anyone truly devoted to God would not write off an obligation, a responsibility, a duty that's supposed to be lifelong, that covers more than one act of honor. That empty shell faith still looks pretty good from the outside. It seems and it probably feels just and purpose-driven. You're doing all the things you're supposed to do. Only a guy like Jesus could hear a few seemingly fair questions from the mouths of empty faith people and spot the sham. We have a harder time than Jesus seeing through to the empty middle. Maybe because the busyness of minding all the rules and minding other people's following of the rules and legislating other people's behaviors, all of that stuff keeps us from noticing what's missing on the inside. There's still activity, there's still noise. It's just hard to tell sometimes that the noise is a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. That's Paul's words. That the noise is sound and fury signifying nothing, if you prefer Shakespeare. That is a real problem inside church. It doesn't help us to deny it's there. I'm not picking on our church. I'm saying church generally, both mainline churches, evangelical churches, all the churches across the whole of Americanized Christianity. Here we are, and we have this issue. The people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far away. You do away with God's word in favor of the rules handed down to you, which you pass on to others. Please notice, Jesus didn't say you should do away with the rules. He said you do away with God's word in favor of the rules. He's talking about the way we order and value the things we pass along. Because yeah, we do have to pass some things along. Tradition is real. It's a real part of Christianity. At its best, our traditions are sacred things. But do we do away with God's words by putting our developed, inherited, often unquestioned norms first and leave God's living Holy Spirit a distant second? That's what Jesus is saying and asking. Do we make the traditions that are supposed to prove our love in the world something more important than acts of the same love? That's what Jesus is saying. Do we miss chances to create some new and maybe more relevant tradition that lives out the same continuing mission of loving the world that God so loves? 
We know we're not supposed to change God's eternal word to fit into culture. But Jesus seemed to know something more than that point. Jesus seemed to know with absolute clarity that the very, very religious have a potentially bigger problem than that. It's much more likely that the ones deep inside will hold our traditions too tight. Or that the ones at the top will come to take advantage. And sometimes our structures will blind us to the living, moving Holy Spirit that calls us ever closer to our neighbors and lands us in an orbit closer and closer around the center, which is Christ. You know who doesn't struggle to see through sham faith? (laughs) You know who does not struggle to prioritize people over rules? It's the outsiders to Christianity. They just do the kind things if they're kindly people. It's so often the outsiders that point the way. And outsiders is exactly what Jesus and his friends were in the passage I read on that day. Because the disciples had shown up for dinner with dirty hands. And right here is where my opening analogy falls apart, by the way, because Jesus is not a parent concerned about germs. And we're not even really sure that they were physically dirty hands, right? It could have been a metaphoric, unclean hands. Uh, But Jesus didn't even see any uncleanliness there. I mean, look, water was hard to come by, and maybe there were some smudges. Maybe the signs of the day still existed on their actual hands. Everyone knew there was a perfectly good reason why rules had been established around the washing of dirty hands. But Jesus also knew what his friends were actually being accused of was not following an unyielding set of rules. And Jesus was not having it. Because it was just too silly, just too silly to think, too silly to buy into that the actual work of those human hands that day was less important, less holy, or any less of an offering to God than a ritual washing. Listen to me, Jesus says, all of you and understand. There is nothing outside of a person that can enter and contaminate a person in God's sight. Rather, the things that come out of a person contaminate that person. What comes out matters. And what was coming out of the Pharisees that day was nothing like kindness or mercy. I still remember the first time that I read these verses for myself. I was in high school, and I know exactly how the ending of this passage made me feel. When Jesus said, there is nothing you can put in that will contaminate you, I felt such hope. I felt such hope because I heard Jesus saying, this is not literal, I'm not telling you I heard Jesus. Um, In my mind, the way I process the words, I heard it's what's already in us that must matter most. If what comes out counts, it's what's already in there that must matter most. And if it's what's already there, then two things at once were true to me. What's in us can come out in ugliness It can be spoken or acted upon to defile and degrade, or, and, also, what's in us can come out in beauty. It can speak and act to make the people around us more beautiful. And if it's what's already inside us that matters most to Jesus, then I am stubbornly convinced there's a lot of good stuff inside people along with the bad. No one's ever going to convince me that's not true. There is a lot of good stuff in us already. And the job duty of the Pharisees was to bring out the best stuff. Not to conform the people to any human will or set of rules, but to fan the divine that's already in the people until it flames and spreads. The enforcers lost their way. They went too far. 
Enforcers always have, and enforcers always will. But here's the best good news I have to offer today. Acts of sincere, genuine love and care are never impure. Feeding your friends can't be an unholy act because Jesus says so. Jesus says so as he makes sure that everyone has enough at the end of a day. As Jesus calls out hollowness and hypocrisy, as Jesus urges us to listen and understand well, it's what bursts forth from us, what we speak and spread around, that has power. It has ritual power. That's where our real cleanliness comes from, and it's our choice. It's our choice, which we are, what we do. If we have ears to hear, let us hear. We already are holy. Amen.